Today in the studio, folks, I got a badass for you, Joe DeSena. What's happening? What's up? Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Thank you. If you guys don't know who this dude is, he's the CEO and founder of Spartan. He's an NBC host. He's a podcast host. He's an author. He was a Wall Street guy, but I'm sure you've heard of all the races that are out there that the badasses do. Is, is it called Spartan Race? Yeah, Spartan and uh, Tough Mudder. I've heard, and, it, I've, I've heard of them all, but I'm not sure what's the difference. So Spartan is um, attempting to be a sport. We wanted to get it into the Olympics. It's legit. You're getting timed. You're getting ranked. You can't skip obstacles. If you can't do an obstacle, you got to do 30 burpees, which obviously sucks. Tough mutter. Folks are going out together. They're tackling that challenge together. If they got to skip an obstacle, they skip an obstacle. So still hard as hell. But um, one is attempting to be a sport. One is a challenge for the day. Which one's harder? <sighs> Depends depends on the event. I mean, world's toughest mutter is brutal. It's a hundred miles. Um, it just depends on the event. And you're running, running, walking, crawling, just trying to survive. But there's no machines involved. No, no, no. You're not taking a dirt bike. There's no ATV. We're not driving around a golf cart. So I mean, you, you said you, you you grew up in working class Queens, right? And you basically had an entrepreneurial spirit since since early. You built a multi million dollar pool company. Yeah, so I grew up, if you ever saw the movie Goodfellas, yeah. I grew up ground zero for Goodfellas. The Varios lived right across the street. Uh, Kennedy Airport was a couple of blocks away. My dad was in a trucking business. Were and every you, Were you Kolojo? A little bit. <laughs> yes, a little bit of that. Um, I would wake up in the morning, go downstairs in the garage, and there might be 500 pairs of leather ski mittens in the garage. And you'd say, why, why do we have, you know, you're, you're six years old. Why are there 500 pairs of sneakers or this or that? And it's because they didn't make it where they were supposed to go. So you're a kid, you're me growing up in that. And there's a lot of stuff going through your head. Number one, um, am I tough enough? Because these guys go to jail. The narrative is that's college, right? Um, number two, can I hang? Can I, can I hustle the way everybody's hustling? Because not everybody did bad things in the neighborhood, but, but those that didn't typically had family businesses and, and they were... Um, they had a CB radio in their, in their kitchen while they were making meatballs and sauce, right? They were running a tow truck company or, or they ran a pizza place or a cement yard. And so um, if you weren't hustling, if you weren't moving, you got left behind. So anyway, I, uh, I very quickly, you know, grabbed what I needed to grab and, and got going. My neighbor was the head of the Bonanno organized crime family. And uh, he took me in under his wing at a very young age and said, come clean my pool. And he taught me some business lessons and he got me another customer and another boss and another guy. And before you know it, uh, fast forward 12 years, I had 700 customers. Wow. Um, so I had nice <clears> you don't want to screw up those deals. I did not want to end up under a pool. I, um, I was trusted. I worked hard. And, um, you know, that first job I had, that customer said, that, Joe said to me, uh, listen, on time is late. When, you, when you're supposed to be here at 8 a.m., you better show up 745. He said, go above and beyond. So if you're supposed to clean the pool, I also want you taking care of the shed, straighten up the lawn furniture, clean the windows, even though you're not getting paid for that. And then number three, never ask for money. If you do a great job and you're valuable, you'll get paid. Don't worry about it. And those three things I kept with me uh, my whole life. And look, for a young kid that didn't know anything about business to, to go from uh, one customer to 700 um, is a testament to what I learned from these guys. Did you did you sell that business? I, I, it was very interesting. Throughout the years, I was trying to hire labor. And I would hire the American kids from the neighborhood. And they were terrible. They would last with me three days, five days. Somehow, I stumbled upon two kids from Poland. And this is, this is when the wall just came down in you know, the Soviet um, era there. And uh, and these Polish kids, they outworked me. They would show up before me, you know, before I was awake, they were there, they'd stay later. They just wanted more hours. So when I sold the business in uh, 1995, they were, they were the buyers. And, no kidding. What a good story that great is. Great story. And they, um, they are multimillionaires. They're still there. We stay in touch. And yeah, it's, it's, it's um, you got to pat yourself on the back when that happens. Yeah, dude, that's what's freaking unbelievable about things like that. Helping other people. Then you, then you basically went to wall street. Why wall street? Well, so somehow I, um, I made my way into college and while I was at uh, university, I met a guy, another Italian guy. 
And the Italian guy saw my hustle, the same thing the guys in the neighborhood were seeing. And he said, what are you doing when you graduate? And I said, I'm going back to the neighborhood. I'm running my business. I'm, all my customers are wise guys. I'm doing very well. And he said, you're an idiot. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you got to go to Wall Street. He said, with your work ethic and your attitude, you got to go to Wall Street. And I didn't really know much about, I knew the 1987 crash and I assumed there was no more money to be made there. And, and he drove me nuts. When I graduated, he called me every month for like four years. And he said, uh, have you made a decision yet? Have you gone yet? No, Al, leave me alone. I'm running my business. Things are going great. I got backhoes and bobcats now and trucks and we're putting in pools and doing construction. And he said, you're wasting your time. You got to get out of the neighborhood. And he called me one day, four years into those phone calls, 48 phone calls later. And he said, listen, just do me a favor. You're making money, buy a stock. And I had never bought a stock. And he convinced me to buy the stock Syntex, a drug company. And that day I was picking up a big check from a customer of mine. I had, I had rebuilt um, his house, their house. And he was a pharmacist, so he would know drug stocks. So I asked this guy, his name was Eli. I said, Eli, my buddy's telling me to buy this stock Syntex. Um, I never bought a stock before. And he goes, I can't believe it. He goes, I'm buying some Syntex today. And in front of me, the guy buys like 10,000 shares at $14 a share, 140 grand, which I thought was insane. You're gonna put $140,000 on a stock. And so anyway, he sits me down and he says, now's the time to do it. You're single, you're making money. Now you could take risks. I suggest I'm going to help you open an account with my broker. And he does it. And I do the same. I buy 10,000 shares. And the next day the company gets taken over and it goes to $24. I make a hundred grand and I'm like, I'm going to Wall Street. This is the greatest business ever. I didn't have to, I didn't have to lay any cement, lay any bricks, fight with people to get paid. This was awesome. So um, that was the impetus to, to make the transition. So then you went to Wall Street and made a bunch of money or what? Yeah, it wasn't that easy. I mean, I had to fight to get a job. I had to work my way up. And um, eventually I ended up building a business on Wall Street, a trading firm. And, and so uh, made money, but never thought that that would be my resting place. Always knew that it was just a moment. I'd make some money and then eventually get out. And not a lot of people can get out because when you're making that kind of money, it's hard to leave. But you did. You said, I've got enough, apparently. Yeah, enough. it's it's never enough, right? And and um, but I but I do recognize my mom died at a young age, my dad died, and I do recognize that really the asset we all have is time, and it's fleeting, and so um, I did my time, I made my money, and that's it. I pulled the, the I pulled the cord. So you made you made some change. Made a little well, bit of change, approximately. I know you probably not, don't not, tell people, but not, like not 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 enough. Not, eight figures. Yeah. So well over eight figures. Yeah, I did. I did well enough that um, I did well enough. And I hate talking like this, but I did well enough that I haven't been really paid by Spartan in 20 years. <laughs> so it's been like it's, you know, I'm in a fight to not run out of money before I die. That's that's where I am right now. But you made enough money to basically say, hey, I'm I'm, I'm considering retiring. So you moved to Vermont, moved to Vermont, you planning on Spartan, were you? No, I was, I, while we were on Wall Street, I was competing in events, really grueling long distance events around the world as a way to clear my head because there was so much stress on Wall Street. And, um, and I felt alive when I, when I competed in the races myself. I felt so alive that I thought, wow, this could be a business. I'd like to do this business. And I would convince my clients and soon to be clients to come do these things with me. I convince anybody to do these crazy adventures with me. And um, in 2000, 22 years ago, I said, um, I like to do this as a, as, as a business. And so I bought the farm, randomly met this girl who became my wife. Um, we moved up to Vermont, uh, bought goats, chickens, uh, Scottish Highlander cows, uh, had four kids together and, um, and built this thing called Spartan. And ultimately, you know, the farm was a part of that or you put it the on farm, anywhere? Yeah, no, the farm was in the middle of nowhere. Pretty well, Why there? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Why Vermont? Out. Yeah, like why, so, why'd you go there? So um, I meet this girl who becomes my wife, Courtney, and I'm continuing to challenge myself physically with these events. And one of the events we went on together was in Idaho. And it was right next door um, to Jackson Hole. And I thought, man, it'd be cool to have a farm somewhere. But I didn't know where. Where would you 
get a farm. And everything in Jackson Hall was so expensive. It was ridiculous and it was so far from New York. And I really couldn't visualize my life 10 years, 20 years later. Um, on the plane uh, flight home from, from uh, Jackson Hole, from that area, th there was a magazine in the back seat of the, of the plane. And I was going through real estate, 20 million, 30 million, crazy numbers. And there was a Vermont farm, covered bridge, horses, mountain, tons of acreage, 400 grand. I got to check this out. And it's near Killington where I had skied as a kid. So we went up there and bought the farm. Now, was your first event on the farm? First event was up the street from the farm. Our, um, well, now these events are everywhere, right? These events are 45 countries now. Yeah, because like I've seen Tough Mudders and Spartan everywhere, you know, uh, races yep. advertised, and like I've never done one. Maybe you're you're going to do one. We're going to, what we're going to do, what I would propose if you'd be willing, is we're going to give you uh, 300 entries, no charge, and you're going to energize your audience. Um, and we'll do one in Vegas, wherever you want. And you take 300 people out and, um, and just get through it together. You will build a bond with those 300 people. That's much stronger than anything you could do over the airwaves or for uh, sure, or, or reading books or whatever. Like you do that together with your audience, your family, you went to war together with them. Now do corporations do a lot of this? We do. I got a, uh, next week I got to meet Google the week before with Saks Fifth Avenue, took two private planes to our event in New Hampshire. I had to meet them. So so big companies come out because they they want to build a culture of resilience within the organization. Yeah. Well, when you say 300, it's like, dude, I mean, I can make an announcement here and I'm sure fill it up. But Let's, I'll give you 3000, <laughs> whatever you want. Let's but, do it. But I mean, what 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 <laughs> <laughs> what the, the purpose would be to bond with them? The purpose would be I don't to bond necessarily with them. want to bond with 3000 strangers. Do why, you? why not? Well, because what if they're whack jobs? Well, I do get the way I know what you mean. I get the whack jobs. Um but um, like I could bring my company there, but there ain't 300 of them. No. Well, it, but listen, you could uh, have somebody if you want. We could vet them. We can make sure that they're not whack jobs because um, 300 people that you build a strong bond with or 3000, whatever it makes. It really sends the company on a trajectory. For sure. I, I would I would 100 percent agree with that. If I'm listening to this podcast and, you know, figured out that if I brought my people to one of those races, you'd get you know, an uptick in production, camaraderie, everything. Well, our business um, quintupled on Wall Street when I started doing these crazy things with my customers and would-be customers. Now, how do you get the customers? How do you market and advertise for these races? Well, now everybody knows it. So like if you're signed up for one, you're rounding up 10 of your friends. Now it's just kind of momentum at this point. We obviously do a lot of videos, like a podcast. I write books. I'm always trying to... Um, shake free from the couch that next person but i would say we've got momentum why do you have a passion to do this i um i don't know i think if i change 100 million lives i get a free pass to heaven <laughs> right? i get a free pass and they're gonna just wave me and it would all the bad stuff i did in my life i get a free pass did you do some bad stuff I didn't, do, I mean, I'm not, uh, I didn't kill anybody, which is good. Um, but I definitely made some mistakes as a kid. I was in the wrong environment. Didn't and, we all? Yeah. And so, um, so, yeah. I used to go to the mall, pick up receipts off the floor and go grab off the shelf what they were and get the money back for it. Or allegedly, I still say, cause I don't know statutes. I've been, I've been there. <laughs> and you know, people are like, Brad, I can't believe you tell people that. And it's like, yeah. guys, your past doesn't define you. Mm -mm. Like people can change. Do you believe that? Oh, I, I've seen people change. I saw people I've go, changed. Yeah, I've saw people go away for decades and uh, come out a different. Per so yeah, absolutely. You can. You got to make the decision that you want to change. Yeah. So so this is all you do now is just build this because this turned into quite a big thing, right? It's not just it's not just the Spartan Trail, Deca, well, uh, we, Tough Mudder, Highlander. Yeah. To 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 your point, we want to be the Louis Vuitton of hard shit. So um, when you think about Louis Vuitton, they own a bunch of brands. If you buy this pocketbook over here or this pair of shoes, they probably own both different brands. Uh, if it's hard, if it's challenging, if it scares you, we want to own that. Who decides what the race is going to include? We've got a team. We've got 600 people. Does um, it change a lot? It does. We want to keep it fresh, keep people um, on their toes. Is it physically exhausting? Yes, but possible. Um, you, are it, you throwing up afterwards? 
Well, I, I was about to say no, but at Fenway, we do an event at Fenway. And there's a spot at Fenway where we challenge people on the Airdyne bike is one of the obstacles. And I, I looked over the bar. There's a bar that's obviously not being used during our race. And there is a pile of vomit. And apparently a bunch of participants after doing that are throwing up over there, which just means they're not living uh, a healthy life. You know, they, they need to do a little work on their fitness. Or, or your shit is grueling. Or our shit is grueling. Um, look, here's what I would say. I would say in Africa, um, the average woman that's, you know, going to get water for her village is walking like, what, 10 miles? I would say that's harder than what we do. I think, I think as a society, we've become so soft. Uh, Uber Eats, Netflix, you name it, that um, doing something as simple as this um, makes some people throw up. So walk me through a race real quick. The gun goes off, everybody's sitting in. How do you know if you're in front or in the back? Well, if you're frisky, you're up front, right? We're, we're, if we've got 10,000 people there that weekend, we're letting 300 out with each wave. Each wave goes out about every 15 minutes because we don't want to congest up the course. And, um, and so if you're frisky and you're out front, the gun goes off, you take off, you're probably running for an eighth of a mile and then you're seeing your first obstacle. Then you're running and you're seeing your second obstacle. And those obstacles might be a rope climb, very hard for people, uh, climbing over walls, crawling under barbed wire, carrying sandbags, um, climbing a mountain. So it do you, just- Do you work as a team? More so in a Tough Mudder than a Spartan, but you, people say to me, Joe, I'm surprised at the camaraderie. Even though we're competing, people are reaching over and pulling you up over these walls. And so that's nice to hear that, that uh, there is some nice humanity out there. Now, obviously, you're not at all the races. Can't be. No. Are you at any of them anymore? I'm probably at 10 per year around the world. Are you, know? you en entering? I always do them. Yeah, I get out there. I might I might not start at the start line and, and end at the finish, but I'll go check out the course and I'll cover some mileage. I'll usually carry a sandbag around. I don't want to be a fraud. So, um, so I get involved. Are, are you now starting to take it easy? I mean, you've probably done a bunch of them from tip to tail, no? I mean, I've done a lot of races in my life, um, all kinds of events. Um, I don't. I, I woke up this morning getting ready for this thing. I knocked out 300 burpees. So, I, I, you know, as I was doing the burpees this morning, I was reflecting and saying, Joe, you're getting soft. But um, for most people, 300 burpees in the morning is a lot of burp. You know, it's a lot. Why, why burpees? I'm a big believer. Remember, I used to clean swimming pools. And with a swimming pool, it has a pump and a filter. And the human body has a pump and a filter, right? We've got a heart, we've got lungs, we've got kidneys, liver. And so I believe that if you shut the pump off on your swimming pool and you threw a bunch of French fries and coffee and burgers and everything in the pool, it turns green. I believe we do that to our bodies. When you do burpees, it's like cleaning the pool. You're moving blood around. You're getting the heart pumping. Um, sure, you can go on a run, but it's not the same. It's not the same as, as really you know going horizontal, going vertical, horizontal. Ver burpees uh, shake things up. Really? Yeah. Because I've recently gotten into fitness. As you can tell, I'm starting to get a little You're a bit. beast. I'm starting to get there. Mm. Um, it's only been three months, though. You, are you taking steroids or what? Because you're looking no, good. No. Dude, I don't look that good. <laughs> That's natural? I don't look that good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, look at this. That's a tight shirt, though. That's, that's what it is. I ain't looking it's back a fitted good, shirt. You can tell when people are on steroids, at least I can. You, and you can tell I'm not. But I wouldn't be opposed to it. But it, at the end of the day, not for vanity reasons. I, I, health is most important to me. Nice. Like, if I'm going to do any kind of supplemental bullshit, it's going to be because it, it'll longevity, yep. better for you, healthy. Yep. And I don't know if, you know. You don't know if steroids, steroids will do that are, for you. Yeah, well, it's not, from what I hear, they don't. No, I agree with you. I um, I believe in something called health span instead of lifespan. So I watched my dad uh, the last 20 years of his life in and out of hospitals. And that's no way to live, right? So we should take care of ourselves, to your point, um, in a way where we're born, we live a healthy life, and we drop dead. You don't want to spend the last 20 years in a hospital. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thinking seriously about a little shot of test because I'm getting old. Mm, how old are you? And a little HGH, 53. 53. So I, I debate it too. And I say, well, how, how long do you want to live? 100. Yeah, I want to go to 100 too. So I, 
I'm thinking like 60, because because again, I don't know the negative side effects to it, right? To your point. And so do I want to be 47 years on HGH? <laughs> it's a lot of time on that. And once you start, supposedly you're you supposed stick to keep with going. It, right? So, and I'm still attacking my wife every night I see her. So like, I don't know, maybe 60. I'll, I'll start. And, and by the way, I mean, I've done steroids before when okay. I was, yeah, when I was a, I don't know, I wouldn't say kid, maybe 20. I freaking did a whole bunch of test and D ball. And, oh, wow. You went for it. Well, I just got all big and swole for about, you know, four months, but then I stopped. They said, you can't just stop. I just stopped cold Turkey. Didn't even scale down. Or wow. Anything. But it never really affected me. You know, I've always been uh, fairly lucky when it comes to health and shit, but I also haven't like, you know, beat my body up my whole life is, is going to these races going to beat the shit out of you. It's definitely, um, you know, Trump said like, Hey, I think you could only do so much in a life, a yeah. lifetime. And, and, and that became a narrative in the country for people that don't want to work out. I, I mean, I've done 300 miles straight. I've done tons of hundred mile runs. I've run tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of miles I've biked. And, um, I just, because of the way I do it and because I focus on yoga and taking care of myself, I haven't seen negative effects. My wife, on the other hand, who was a high level, high level soccer player, and uh, it was more speed work and fast and intense. She had knee problems and you see that, right? You see that with hockey players and football players and, and stuff. So I would say, um, as long as you're not running on a track at like four minute miles every day from a cold start, you can go for a long time doing slow and easy stuff. Have you ever uh, awarded the winner a, a massive cash prize or anything? What's the winner? We, we offered one year, um, and I'd like to get back to this. We offered one year a million dollars to anybody who could win three of our marquee events. Um, we knew it would be nearly impossible. Otherwise, we wouldn't have come up with a million dollar purse. Um, the guy came really fucking close, and I was sweating. We were in Iceland. I mean, really close. And he just, he, he gave up. He gave up. It was cold. It was a hundred. He had a hundred miles to go with a ton of obstacles in a snowstorm and around mile 65. And it looked like he was going to do it. And he started to taper off. It was, it was a close call. <laughs> were you happy he tapered off? It was funny, right? Because on the one hand, I was happy. On the other hand, I wanted him to do it. So it was, it was, I was questioning myself. I said, Joe, you're going to, you got to write a million dollar check, but part of me wanted him to do it. And you got 10,000 people showing up for these things. We got 10,000 people showing up for these things. Jesus. Yeah. That's yeah. a freaking stadium full. Oh, it's crazy. You got, you got the how energy. You, it's, it's just unbelievable. How do you handle security and all that shit? You know, it's how not, do you know if they paid or not? Um, they got to go through a registration process and, um, get a number and they get a number and a bib and, and all that. So, um, so that's fine. Uh, we do pay for security and ambulances and all those things. It's a very expensive endeavor, um, for yep. us to put on. What kind of permits do you need for that? Lots of permits, um, lots of, uh, fighting with cities and townships, et cetera. So, uh, and this is happening in 45 countries, um, simultaneously, simultaneously. It is a, you have uh, a big team then we got a big team, very smart team. Uh, amazing. I, don't, I couldn't even sit here and tell you how they do it. They do it. Um, yeah, it is amazing. And the book that you wrote, smart. 10 rules for resilience. That one was, I wrote a few books. That's the last book I wrote. And, um, and that's a parenting book. Uh, what the hell do I know uh, about parenting? But we have four children and I fought with my wife on this one because she's like, we're not writing a parenting book because who knows if we screw up or not. You never know. And But the message was simply, um, we should put obstacles in front of our kids. We shouldn't take them away. Mm. Um, that's the message. And so... That's a damn good message, too. Yeah. We push our, our, chill, our four children, we push pretty damn hard. What kind of obstacles would you suggest people put in front of their children? Well, listen, uh, since my kids are three years old, they've been waking up at 5.30 in the morning, whether they like it or not. They're working out. They're always... Um, See, me, you and my wife would have a big problem. Because I say the same shit. They have well, to. I get up at 4.35 automatically, thank God, and I'm full of energy the second I do. I don't drag, but, you know, I'm sometimes waiting until 9, 30, 10 for my kids to wake up. And I keep telling my wife, because she's the one that has to take care of them and deal with them. So yeah. I kind of let her decide because I'm not there to deal with them all day. She says if they don't sleep, they are cranky. How, how old are they now? Right now, seven and nine and six months, the ones at home. Congrats. So, um, I would, um, 
I would I would get going on the early morning stuff if I were you at this point. That's but, what I'm saying. And the reason I did it, uh, well, but again, who the hell knows? But Maybe she says they're cranky and she has to deal with them. So it's like, what do you, how do you? Here's my here's her? my answer to that. Um, but again, your wife and my wife would get along famously, right? This is more me and more you than it is them. Um, I would say there's two ways to get a lot of sleep. One is to sleep late. The other is to go to bed early. So if your kid's going to bed early, then they're getting all the sleep they need. <laughs> like, and so yeah, they don't though. Well, that, that's a fight in turn. Like, I, like every night, every night for 16 years, I've been having this fight and, um, guys get to bed. I'm fighting with the whole house. And then in the morning I'm turning the lights on, I'm turning, <laughs> I'm playing ACDC. I'm, I'm waking the whole house up. Like whether you like well, it or not. That's <laughs> so, right. So, you know, what do they do when they get up though? And they got to work out for, for the, look, for the early part of their life. When my oldest was four, I had seen the movie Kill Bill with Uma Thurman. And Uma Thurman was training, if you remember, with a Kung Fu master. And so I said to my wife, I said, we should get a Kung Fu master to move in with us and wake the kids up early every morning and train them. And so she said, okay. And so somehow we procured a Kung Fu master from China to move onto the farm and wake the kids up every morning at 5.30 in the morning. And so um, it would be a fight and the whole house is going crazy. Uh, and, then, and then the Kung Fu master and my first child and then my second child and finally four children would go over to the barn and train. And then they would train every night. And my theory was if I can get them tired enough, they're going to go to bed early. They're going to become physically fit so later in life, unlike me, uh, they would have six packs and they would have confidence. Um, and then whatever t sport they chose later in life, they'd probably be good at because they're training every day. And, um, and I didn't know, by the way, that uh, it would be easier to get into a good college if they were good at a sport because I didn't play a sport as a kid. So um, fast forward now, 12 years, because my first one started at four, we've been doing, we've had a structure like this and we're seeing the rewards. Uh, the, the oldest kids getting recruited to a top school in the country. And like, he's saying, Oh my God, now I know why my dad did this. Is this book going to teach me how to do it or, yes. or what to do? No, it'll teach you how to do it, uh, what to do, but you have to get, um, so you can't fight with your wife over it. Like, thank God my wife finally just gave up and lets me roll with it. But, um, you got to do it. You got to convince her. Yeah, well, I've been trying. You got it. You got to do and it. She says, until I stay home and deal with them, let her worry about but it. But listen, I, I, your wife's going to hate me for this, but like that's like that's the argument for handing kids a device to shut them up. Which we or, do. Or a cookie. You can't do it. Which we do. Cookies too. You can't do it. You, we got to change things at your house. I got to move in. If, I, if, 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 if they're, you know, acting up, her threat is I will take the iPad. Well, on occasion which by the way, we don't necessarily always do what we threaten either, which is, I know is a problem, yeah. but anyway, she'll, she'll say, well, we'll take your iPad. So on occasion she's taken the iPad. Well, they freak of course. out. Of course they're and, addicted. And then obviously you don't want your kids to cry and be all sad. So you find a way to let them get their iPad back. But man, I'm telling you, everything you're saying is what I'm saying I want, I want your kids. I, I put on a death camp uh, every summer in June on the farm for kids. I got about 50 kids and uh, I want your kids uh, this coming summer. Death camp. Death camp. Yeah. Spartan death camp. Google it. You'll see the video. Um, I'll, I'll take your two kids on me. Uh, if your wife, girls. If, that's fine. If your wife will allow it. Um, <laughs> we'll ask her. Yeah. Ask her. Um, and we'll, uh. we'll level them up. Well, that's what they need, man. And people listening to this, they, they need to understand that like putting obstacles in front of your kid is helping your kid, they're, they're, not letting them eat the donuts and giving them the ice cream. Cause again, I know how it feels like I want to show them, like we have a new six month old, you know, I want to give her ice cream. Why? Just so I could see her face on damn, that's just good. But we're causing diabetes. We're causing lifelong problems and, and we're doing it out of love, which is the craziest part. Well, but, you're, you're doing it. You're, we're, we're really doing it because we want to be liked by them. Right. Like, like think about if my wife was on the right side of the room and I was on the left side of the room and my kids hadn't seen us for a week and they came in this room, they'd go right to my wife. She's like cotton candy. They would not come to me. But when they're 30 years old, I bet you they say dad was right. hundred yeah. percent. I mean, I used to 
hate when my dad did some shit, but yep. you know, eventually, you know, I, I said, yeah, you know, he, he knew what he was doing, but he didn't do a lot of it. Unfortunately, we were the, we were the children should be seen and not heard. Mm. He didn't get us up. He, he, he basically made sure we didn't die. He get, made sure there was food in the house and we had some clothes and you know, the rest was like, figure it out and get out of my face. By the way, that's a good strategy too, though, because you clearly figured it out, right? It like, made me, it made me understand like yeah. how to get shit done, solve problems, you know, take responsibility, yeah. you know, own it myself. If you want something done, you know, get it done. So it definitely made me a lot more likely to succeed than had he catered to me and, and given you what you needed. Yeah. Right? And, and, and when you, you know, have kids, you, you kind of want them to be happy and have the ice cream. But at the end of the day, man, we were screwing them. We're screwing them that way. Privilege hurts. Privilege is, is a problem. I mean, you think about that kid that's growing up in uh, New Delhi or, or in a favela in Brazil, right? They're, they're just going to naturally be better at tackling hard shit. Um, we're, we're coddling them. In the neighborhood I grew up in, it was interesting, right? Because these bosses that fought their way to the top had kids typically that were soft and not like them. And I was scratching my head as a young person saying, I don't understand. Why are their kids fuck ups? Well, it's because they're giving them everything. They didn't have it as kids. They wanted to give them all this stuff. And that doesn't make a kid hard. It doesn't make a kid talented. Now, does a kid need to be hard? They gotta be hard to, to, to they gotta be hard enough to tackle life's challenges. So I would say if life was like rowing a boat across the Atlantic. There's going to be waves, there's going to be storms, whatever. And you and I were about to take that on. Wouldn't we train in rough seas? Or would we train down in Tortola on a beach with, you know, still water? No, we would train in rough seas. So how could you expect the kid to go handle life when we're not around? You, God forbid, you and I might not be here. What if you leave him a bunch of dough, though? It's not enough. Are you going to leave him a bunch of dough? I don't know. I'm debating that one. I don't I know. I would say leave him the dough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I would, I, you know, I wish my dad left me a bunch of dough. Well, you're older now. You would be, you know, would you have handled it at a younger age? Absolutely. You think you would have did the right thing? I would have appreciated it even more. <laughs> I don't know. I got to debate it, it. It, it. When I die, I'm giving all my money to my kids. Yeah. Like, like if they blow it, they turn into dirt dickheads. I'm dead. Whatever. All right. I'm not going to give them um, the money without rules, though. So, like, if they're total dirt balls and they're not doing anything good, I got to figure these out. But they'll have some rules. But I'm, they're getting it all. And I wish my parents would have gave it all to me. I am. Um, well, I, they didn't have any, but had they had any. Because I keep thinking, like, Warren Buffett says he ain't giving his kids all the money. By the way, when he says that, right? He doesn't mean all the money. He just means they're not going to, you know what I mean? Like they still might get 10 million each or whatever. So it's not going to be like nothing. Um, I, I would say this on my mother's side of the family, we had a Papa Philly who his nickname was lefty in Brooklyn. He was the biggest bookmaker in New York. He had a ridiculous amount of money and he went out to Long Island. He wanted to get the family out of Brooklyn and he bought everybody a house on two sides of the block. He bought the entire block, every house. So every kid, every grandkid, the, the, the brother, everybody got a house. That entire side of the family was a disaster. Disaster. They didn't know how to work. They smoked a ton of pot. Nothing like the other side of the family where they got nothing and they had to work, they all pulled themselves up by the bootstraps. They got stuff done. So I, the same human beings, right? Same, similar DNA, it was just a matter of being given stuff. So you got to be careful. You got to be real careful. So that one's a parenting book. Ten Rules for Resilience. How many books do you have? Well, I've written five, but I've only published four. Um, so a couple of New York Times bestsellers. Um, yeah. And I do it because I've got to constantly stay in front of people, stay relevant, and get people out to these races. Well, is that your goal, just to get 100,000 people to these races? 100 million. I want I want a hundred million people um, to come out and uh, lose weight, give up drugs, stop drinking, get back with their husband, back with their wife, um, and and so it's just a matter of getting out and doing stuff like this. So when's the next one in Vegas? I think we got I think we got something coming up before year end. Um, we got something in Arizona in November. I'll get you an exact date, but um, I'd love for you to challenge the audience, and uh, it's all on me, or we could tie it to a charity if you want. 
and um and get you out there and and um round up your crew and go get this done well again you know i got to think about that it depends on which one and where explain that and like when what, what, like like what would be good for you why don't i work around you why don't i make it easy for you <laughs> well again i mean like if 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 it was a good time good day you know how long's the how long's the race <laughs> i'm hearing a lot of excuses right That's now dude i hate i hate uh i don't know why i think it's some psychological thing of commitment like when people say, Hey, you want to do this on Thursday? I'm like, yeah, I'll probably do that on Thursday. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to say yes. And now I can't do anything else on Thursday. C can I tell you though, that that's our magic secret sauce, which is that once you commit right now, publicly, you're on the hook, you're going to go to bed early. You're going to wake up early, put down the wine, drink, you know, like everything in your life becomes better. So I would say you work out this psychological issue you have. We make a commitment. I'm not, it's not self-serving. You're not giving me any money. I don't want, right? I just want to help you. So, so let's do this. Yeah, I'm down. You're, you're committing right now. Yeah, let's pick one. The next event in Vegas. The you, Tough Mudder or the Spartan? Either or, whatever the next event is, you're, you're doing. No, see, again, what's the next one? Like if it's in I, a week, I don't have I my, if be. I left my phone in the green room, I don't have if my I, phone. If I show you my schedule, you'll yep. understand. Like I'm gonna have well, to well, cancel shit like, for this. Like the president of the United States cancel shit. We could figure I it know, out. I but there's certain things I can't cancel. I'll change the date of the race if I have to to make it work. <laughs> All right. Well, again, we'll look after this. I'll pick a date. You pick a date. I'm trying to figure out in my head right now while we're talking, how do I get the bomb squad, which is the listeners, yep. to go hit races, whether I'm there or not? Like, when's the next race around the world? Because well, people are going to want to go yeah, now well, that they well, heard well, you. Okay, good call. What we'll do is we'll create a code called Dropping Bombs. Or how about Bomb Squad? Bomb Squad. We'll, we'll create a, cold, uh, a code called Bomb Squad. And for a period of time, let's say 30 days after this thing comes out, um, they'll get a, a discount or free or whatever you want. Um, but they got to commit then. They got 30 days to commit. Anywhere well, in the world. Well, I mean, I'd love to have it free and so would everybody else, but people that listen to me, they probably don't want it free. Okay. I, so I, I put a post out the other day that said, you know, this guy's your friend and you're wanting discounts. This guy's your friend and you're wanting him to hook you up. It's like, if this dude's your friend, why wouldn't you pay what the fuck they're asking? Right. I like that. Why wouldn't you support the dude? Why don't we uh, tie it to a charity? Not is that it, you need support. Is there, I, I, I need support, man. I'm coming out of COVID. You haven't any, any idea how hard COVID was, but- but, um, charity, but, you know, if we talk about that, this one might get suppressed. So I don't want to talk too much about that, but dude, there's a whole bunch of nonsense with that nonsense. Killed me. Killed me. We lost $50 million. Disaster. Got shut down in 45 countries, furloughed 500 people. Um, I can't even tell you what I'm dealing with the federal government right now. Like unbelievable that I'm still, that I'm sitting here, but it's, but well, that's because you're resilient. Yeah, because I trained in those rough seas. Right? <laughs> That's right. Most people would have packed it up. 100%. But, but it's over now, right? Well, I'm still coming out of it. It's over. Canada Canada's still hurting me. Um, oh, yeah. And I got an anchor around my neck from all um, all of what happened, all the bills. All, like, think about being shut down for two years in 45 countries. It was... Um, Why do you have to be in 45 countries? Why not just say, well, fuck Canada then? Well, I want to change. It doesn't say um, my goal is to change a hundred million lives, but not in Canada. <laughs> I want to change hundred million lives everywhere. But you're saying well, why not? People from Canada can come here. Why not kill Canada right now? Um, because I got a huge investment up there. I got trailers. I got people. So I got to get. So, so are these like crews that are there year round, putting them on year round and organizing and getting sponsors and yeah. So if somebody listening, because I got a lot of entrepreneurs listening, what if we want to sponsor a race? How do we do that? You pick an event. Why don't we pick the event you and I pick for Vegas or Arizona? We will literally just call it the Dropping Bombs or Bomb Squad, Spartan or Tough Mudder. Boom. Okay. Done. All right. Huh? Folks, who would come to that? That's my question. How many of you are, are, are willing to fly into Vegas and freaking support this individual and blow that freaking race up? But if you already have 10,000, dude, it'd be hard, hard to make a dent in 10,000 no, people. No, you, you can make a dent. I've, I had a guy once show up with 1,000 people. Wow. Yeah, 1,000. So it, it would be cool to see if you could break that. So uh, average Joe Blow, though, that wants to sponsor it, is, is there a website? Like, like Spartan. I know you have Joe DeSena. And by the way, folks, it's DeSena, D-E-S-E-N-A. 
you want to find him on Instagram, it's at real Joe DeSena, D E S E N A. You can find him, but Spartan race, tough mutter Highlander. What's Highlander? Highlander is a hiking event. So you're going out there, you're doing a 60 mile hike, probably taking two or three days, sitting around by the campfire along the way, setting up tents. Uh, awesome, awesome event. Not everybody wants to run. Not everybody wants obstacles. So Highlander uh, scratches that itch. Now you also have a podcast. What do you talk about on your podcast? Spartan up. Spartan up. I'm bra- I'm basically bringing in folks that are um, going to help you be more resilient. Like it, I, I, I want to talk to experts. Is it a, is it a word play on Spartan up? Yes. Yeah. Spartan the fuck up. Why do you think uh, all that resilience and toughness and you know grueling shit is necessary? How did you? Why did you get it? You you had money. I did, I did it because again I had the mindset from the neighborhood that um, what if I have to go to jail? What if that's the deal? Right? I got to be tough enough. So at a very young age, I was taking cold showers and carrying rocks around. That people thought I was nuts, but I was playing that tape in my head. Am I tough enough to be in this crew? You know, with, with all these folks. So, um, but I would say the the better answer is. If this was the 1700s, if you and I were doing this in the 1700s with two cups and a string, um, I would probably say we don't need to be more resilient. We don't. We need more couches. We need more Netflix. People are dying at young ages. We're standing in horse shit every day. Um, in this world we live in, where everything's at our fingertips and we're learning helplessness and we're soft and moms and dads are handing devices and cookies to kids. Like, We need this because when the shit hits the fan, when COVID hits and a guy that owns a business like me gets punched in the face 350,000 times, um, I want to be able to stand up and fight back. Uh, And I wouldn't have been able to fight back, to your point, had I not practiced hard. Hmm. I wrote a book called The Hard Way. Oh, I like it. It's lessons I learned the hard way so you don't have to. I like it. And what's funny about that book because I don't promote it much, but when I do, I, I talk about the fact that you're going to learn these lessons regardless. The question is, how much is it going to cost you? Right. Because right now, right. $24 or whatever my book costs, that's right. as cheap as I've ever can imagine you learning that shit. That's what I would recommend everybody do. Get your book, go to the Tough Mudder, put obstacles in front of your kids. That's freaking good shit, man. Could I, could I say one thing though? I, and this is against you and I, in a sense, you shouldn't buy my book or your book because and you shouldn't listen to the podcast. Like it's not enough to read a book and listen to a pod. You actually have to go do it. You have to do something hard. You can't just read about it. Right. Yeah. But it starts, it starts with learning. You got to start somewhere. Do. No doubt about it. You got to start somewhere. Um, but, but, but listen, it could be like, sometimes I'll do in my house. I'll turn the hot water off. I don't tell the family. All of a sudden, everybody's screaming. <laughs> like you got to just shock them a little bit, right? And so, um, do some hard stuff. Do you do cold plunges? I do. Have I've been doing. I like my mother was into this in the seventies. So, do you know Andy Frisella with First Form? I know of him. I don't know him, dude. You you give him a challenge. That dude has massive influence in all like tough mutter type people. Oh, that'd be amazing. Another dude I know named Justin Cross. He's got a big thing called Earn Your Booze. I love it. So he's got like twenty, thirty thousand in his group. We should, we should. Let's do it. Let's do it like a a bomb squad amongst the uh, influencers, like yourself. An influence uh, yeah. event. Yeah. Influencer. Yeah. You get a bunch of them there, man. You can pack that some bitch just by that. Let, by itself. Let's do it. Let's do it, dude. I appreciate you coming in. What'd you come all the way to Vegas for? Not just this. No, I had um, I had a couple of meetings, but uh, but this basically you. Nice. I heard about you, and they said I gotta come, so I'm here. Why is that? I don't who's, know. Who's telling you you had to people be on People are my telling show. me. People that know are saying you're the guy. Come on, man. I'm See, telling you. That's because of my resilience. That's right. I had a million people tell me not to do a podcast. I, You know, you're, you're never going to be a Joe Rogan. Looky now. That's right. It's growing. Who, what's his name? Joe what? Rogan. <laughs> Folks, by the way, follow this guy at Real Joe DeSena. Go get his book. Go quit being a puss. Go f- sign up for a Tough Mudder, for a Spartan Race. Is it called Spartan Trail or Spartan? Well, there's Spartan Trail, that's no obstacles, and then there's Spartan Race with obstacles. Who would want no obstacles? Isn't that called a jog? That is called a trail run, and there are people out there that prefer trail runs. They, they just run on a trail? On a trail. They like it. The obstacles are what makes it fun. Well, there are people that find fun in running on the trails. <laughs> there are lots of people. <laughs> 
Folks, as always, until next time, keep it real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.